So Anthony's opening keynote is uh, actually quite a mouthful. Reality or hype, the challenges for the financial services industry and the likely consequences for business and credit information and customers. So you've got an hour to uh, explain that. Ladies and gentlemen, Anthony Scrifiano. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, so I'm not going to stand behind the podium and I'm not going to do a formal speech. I hope you don't mind. Um, I would like to ask before I start, show of hands, how many people are here for the first time? Wow. Okay. That's impressive. Um, the reason I asked that question is I want to tell you a quick story, and I've told it before. So for those of you that know the story, bear with me. It's worth it. Um, this is a story that has to do with analytics and data and making decisions based on that data. So that's why I'm sharing it. And it takes place sometime during the Second World War. You can put it anywhere you want. In my mind, I put it somewhere in Eastern Europe. There were changing borders, there were guards, there were people that had to show papers all the time. And there's a guard sitting at a place where they have to show papers, and here comes a guy down the road on a bicycle. And there's a large, very large sack balanced on the bicycle, and the guy is really struggling with this sack. And so the guard stops him and he says, what's in the sack? And the guy says, it's a bag of sand. And he said, he takes his weapon down and he says, I'm not going to ask you again, what's in that bag? And he said, sir, I swear to you, it's a bag of sand. Open the bag. He opens the bag. The guard looks in it with his bayonet. He has a dog come out to sniff it. He checks it with a metal detector. He can't find anything. So he says to the guy, look, I'm going to let you go. Today is your lucky day, but I'm memorizing your face. I will remember you. You may be getting away with something today, but you'll never get away with it from me in the long run because I know what's going on. So every couple of weeks, same guy comes by on a bicycle, sometimes a very large bag, sometimes a very small bag, same conversation. Sometimes the guard opens it, sometimes he doesn't. One time he actually spread the sand out on the ground and looked at it. And then he had to help the guy scoop the sand back up into the bag and tie it back up on the bicycle. He apologized. So then things changed, and they never saw each other again. The war ended, and you know, a couple of years later, the guard, the former guard, is no longer in the military, is sitting in a bar, and in comes the guy who used to be on the bicycles with the bags of sand. So they, their eyes meet, and the, the guy calls him over, and he says, look, we're friends now. The war is over. Let me introduce myself sit down, I'll buy you a beer, and they're talking, and then finally the, the guard, the former guard, he puts his beer down, and he says, I can't take it anymore. I can't sleep. I have nightmares. It's ruining me. I have to know, what were you smuggling? And the guy said, bicycles. <laughs> so the moral of this story, and the reason I tell it is I love this story, and I wish I had a better one to replace it with, what are our bicycles? You know, we look at credit reports, we look at um, pieces of information that have been available for generations in some days, the, the, the names of individuals that own companies, we look at prior payment histories, and, and we just heard cyber threats, we just heard you talk about the, the hypergeometric growth of data, the amount of information available to us to make decisions, and we're making decisions in very many cases with the same data, In maybe we automate, but we don't necessarily evolve. We don't necessarily change our thinking about decisions. Regulators are, are faced with this huge issue of regulating something that's coming of age. And AI is worse than an airplane because we understand what an airplane is. There's not even a clearly accepted definition of AI. So we talk about AI as if you know, a company with AI and data is worth more than a company, or AI data and analytics is worth more than a company with just AI and analytics, but what's the difference between analytics and AI? And a lot of AI is just math. So the, the reality and the hype that I'm talking about here in this presentation is what we say and what we actually do. What are the bicycles? What are we not paying attention to? What are we forgetting to think about? The opportunities to use da data in new and amazing ways is, is literally changing as we're in it. This is the industry right now, and this is the time. If you are younger than me, which is most of the people in this room, um, you have a, a big part of your career in front of you to deal with all of this change. There's no guarantee that things get better. There's no guarantee that technology makes our lives easier. We used to say, 
that we want all of this future technology to make our lives easier. I don't know about you, show of hands, how many people think technology makes your life more difficult right now? Everybody should raise your hand. <laughs> uh, it, it, it may make certain things easier. It's certainly nice to have a GPS instead of trying to memorize directions or look at a piece of paper. That's great, I love it. Can you find your way if the GPS doesn't work? Um, some people yes, some people no. Uh, this is a big opportunity, but it's also a big risk for us. So the first thing I do as a scientist is I start by thinking about how is the world around me changing? Forget about what I'm going to do. The first thing I should do is look at how things are changing. And when I look at the industry where I work, so I work for Dun & Bradstreet, and we've been around for a very long time, almost 180 years now. And when we started, information looked like you know collecting pieces of information, either by someone getting on a horse and going somewhere, or maybe a piece of mail, if we were really advanced. This was in modern technology, right? Uh, four US presidents worked for the company, right? Uh, what kind of decisions were we making? Well, here's some credit reports from the 1800s. I think it's safe to do business with him. Purchaser of stolen goods. About to marry a fellow of no significance, or some significance. These are sort of qualitative opinions. When I look at some of these old credit reports, which I love looking at, they're like a narrative. They talk about the, how clean and organized the office space was. They talk about the, the character of the person. They actually say the character of the man. Right? They talk about um, the, the way in which the, 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 the conversation took place. We don't do that anymore. We have credit scores that might say eight on a scale of one to 10. That's kind of like saying, I think it's safe, right? Uh, purchaser of stolen goods, well, we have public records, we have suits, we have liens, we have judgments. Um, about to marry a fellow, well, we don't have that, but we have whether or not a business is minority owned or whether or not the owners of the business are the same as the owners of another business, so we do have information about, really, has anything really changed all that much? We used to, this was modern technology, now this is sort of modern technology, so I guess you could get your credit report on your wristwatch, but does it really change the nature of that decision that we're trying to make? And I would argue not as much as we like to think. So there's lots of AI, there's lots of technology. Some of us uh, were speaking last night about some of the things that we're doing in my data science lab. I'll show you some examples later around adjudication of fraud and judging truthfulness and veracity and anomaly detection. These are amazingly cool technologies. At the end of the day, we're supporting decisions about total risk and total opportunity with a business problem that hasn't really evolved anywhere near as fast as the technology. So what does that mean for our future? The nature of data. This is a word cloud that I made. Um, I just sit down and I write all the things that come to mind when I think about a subject, and then when I start writing the same words over, I make a word cloud. And this was my word cloud for data some time ago. Localization, permissible use, all those words that start with a V, velocity, variety, value, that's big data, uh, privacy, relationships, great. Then I come back and I look at this thing a few months later, six months later, four months later. How has it changed? Well, now we're talking about adversarial data. We're talking about intentionally manipulated data. We're talking about ethical use of data. We weren't talking about that so much not too long ago. So this data that we keep talking about, which is now expanding on Earth at a rate that we can no longer accurately measure, even the rate of increase, let alone the amount of data, is changing in its very nature. We need some new language. We need some new words. We have to keep using the same words, data, AI, analytics, but they don't mean the same thing. And that's a very dangerous place to be. So. If we look now at terminology, I think about words like big. Big data, what does big data mean? Well, it doesn't just mean having a lot of data, it means that it's changing really fast, that it's not necessarily all true. All of these things, all of the Vs, velocity, variety, value, veracity, all of those aspects of data that make it big, right? Well, big a few years ago and big now are two completely different things. So. If you look at the size of a photo today, all of the data storage capacity on the space shuttle is not enough to store one photo. The original space shuttle can't store one photo from an iPhone 11. That's a big problem. 
and I'm using the word big there intentionally, um, we search for things on the internet. How many of you have a, a young, young person in your life? Child, son, daughter, niece, nephew, right? About half the room. They look for everything on the internet. Everything's on a search engine. About 4% of the internet is searchable. 4%. Because most of the internet is created when you look at it. It's, sort of, it's, it's formed by being observed. You also have data that sits behind a password or a firewall. You have data that is dependent upon the input. None of that is really easily searchable. And then there's the dark web, and there's um, app space, and then there's also now we have autonomous devices, edge computing, data that doesn't even sit anywhere. The Internet of Things that we talk about, that's another term. We're not talking about that today. But the Internet of Things is not really an Internet of Things today. It's an Internet of Things connected to the Internet, right? They all go back to something. But now, as those things start to become disconnected and talk to each other without talking back, whoa, that's a little scary. That feels like science fiction. It's not. It's reality today. Um, 5G. If you think about how 5G works, you will all be part of the network pretty soon. So that's something to start and think about. Uh, the definition of learning has changed. That's pretty terrifying. So when I went to school, I, I have four degrees. When I did my first degree, we had these things, we had these places where you went for knowledge and you had to borrow the knowledge. And if someone else was using the knowledge, you had to wait for them to finish using the knowledge so that you could get the knowledge. They were called libraries, right? And we had these things called books, right? I'm, I'm trying to make a joke here. It's clearly not funny, but um, it's sad, right? By the time I got done with school, you know, everything's in a database, everything's searchable. Well, is everything really searchable? No. What is searchable is searchable. And you have to start by asking yourself the question, what is the bias implied by my presumption that the answer to my question is in this data? Well, we don't ask that, because it's too convenient to just go and use a search tool. And then we search in one language, and we only search in a certain domain. Well, of course that changes your answer. Machine learning. There's no learning in machine learning. Machine learning is a bunch of math. It's a bunch of regression. It's a bunch of calculated algorithms that connect data. We have neuromorphic algorithms, algorithms that are designed to work like our human brain, which we don't understand. So there's issues around explainability. We can't necessarily explain how some of these algorithms work. Well, we can't really explain how our brains work either, right? I'm going to do a sequence. I'd like you to tell me the next thing in the sequence. One, two, three, what comes next? Most people are saying four. I would say five, because one plus two is three, and three plus two is five. You didn't know what I was thinking, right? I'm sorry, that was a trick. I'll do an easier one. A, B, no, O. I was doing blood types, right? <laughs> I, if you don't understand the context, you have no right to, most people are afraid to give me an answer, right? <clears throat> um, if you look at the data for uh, whatever we call big data, because data fuels AI, right? Um, the data basically suggests that, and this is very consistent with the opening remarks, that the companies that are using data to do something, like analytics or AI or advisory services, are, are certainly more in demand. There's certainly a bigger part of the, the, the change in the slope of the line. If you look at big data initiatives, a little bit scary, um, and AI is even worse. The initiatives, the hype, the reality versus the hype, the ROI, the expectations of some of these projects are just so enormous and so outrageous that, of course, they don't get realized initially. Does that mean we should fail and we should just stop? No, of course not. It's pretty typical for something new to be not a guarantee and not a surefire success. One of the reasons people are willing to pay three times earnings is that bet that the future capabilities will get even better. We sure all hope so. But then we talk about cyber, and we talk about intentional manipulation of data, and we talk about bias, and we talk about ethics, and I think, well, wait a minute. That's not necessarily a guarantee. There's no guarantee that things absolutely get better. There's a guarantee that things change. And so that leads us to this discussion about the things that I call, well, we call inconvenient truths, those things that are true, 
that we sort of wish weren't true, and uh, the myths, the things that we think are true that are not true. So one of the myths is that AI is some kind of a magic wand. I can throw the data in there and I can hit the machine learning button. Well, you can learn certain things like that, but maybe you should ask a few questions about the stability of that data, the truth of that data. Usually those steps get ignored because they're inconvenient, right? So the inconvenient truth is that all true data is not simultaneously true. Data you collected one day ago is not one day old. These things are a problem that need to be contended with. If we're going to use AI to make decisions, we need to think about where that data came from that fueled that AI. We need to think about the preconditions of the methods that we're using, but we don't because everybody's looking for a silver bullet. They're looking for something quick. And the schools, the universities, and I, I, I admire the challenge of modern universities right now trying to teach data science. What do you teach that will be relevant three years from now? Good luck, right? But at the same time, people graduate with degrees and they feel like they can do anything by downloading data and using a bunch of open source algorithms and, and AIing their way to the solution. And we don't necessarily teach the critical thinking, asking the questions, what do we have to believe? How do we know this is true? How would we know if it changed? How do we know that it's legal? All of those questions are inconveniently there, and most of the time they're only paid attention to when they become a problem. So the secret to making success more permanent is to make new mistakes, not the same mistakes over and over again. I have some examples here for you, and these are just examples. There's so many. Um, there was a fitness app, you know, these um, fitness monitors. They should really not call them fitness monitors because you may not be fit, right? But these, these health things that you wear, right? They count your steps. I left mine home, by the way. Um, so for one week, I'm walking and getting no credit for it. I'm very upset. Um, but um, the, the fitness app, this company, they had a lot of data, right? When you sync your data, it's all in the cloud, whatever that is. Does any, you know, the cloud is not in the cloud, it's data centers, right? But you up, upload your data into a cloud so that you can sort of look at it on different devices. That's wonderful, that's convenient. Well, the, the folks that make this fitness app said, well, wouldn't it be interesting if we looked at where the data was uploaded from because it's part of the stream? And they created this heat map that showed where all of their products were being used all over the world. And I can imagine the room where somebody was looking at this heat map and saying, wow, look how cool this is. Let's put it on the internet. Let's show everybody how popular our device is. And they put it on the internet and they said, look at this. Look at all the places where people are using our fitness monitor. Oh, look, there's a cluster of people near Kandahar. Oh, that was a secret military base. Not anymore. Um, I, that was either the most nefarious plot ever launched or it was just a dumb mistake, right? And I could see it happening one decision at a time, trying to share something. Now, I don't know the backstory, but I, this is my story in my head. Children's toys, don't get me started. Unbelievable, some of the cyber risks in children's toys. You bought your kid a doll that talks to the internet. No, you brought a microphone and an IP address and you put it in your house and you gave it to your kid. What could possibly go wrong? A lot. Um, there's a lot of exploits going on with these sorts of things. Um, there's a, um, you know, big data breaches, right? This is another term that doesn't necessarily mean anything. What is a breach? Is a breach when I break into your system, steal your data and walk away from it? That's a breach. If I break into your system and I do something that I shouldn't have been able to do because I'm not allowed in your system, that's a different type of data breach. If I break into your system and change the data to make you do something you wouldn't ordinarily do, that's another type of data breach. All of these things are called data breaches. We need some new terminology, right? But the data breaches, the cost of these data breaches, whatever they are, is just unbelievable. And the number of human beings affected by this is just slowly approaching like the population of the Earth. Um, I, I mean, I don't even want to start quoting any one of these, but millions upon millions upon millions of people affected by data breaches. Do you know how you can tell when something sneaky is going on on the internet? When anything is going on on the internet. Everywhere data is being used in ways that it's unintended. So then the other problem we have is that AI, this thing that we call AI, is starting to, we, you, uh, Mark, I think you talked about taking our jobs away, right? I don't know if I agree 100% that it's taking our jobs away. I think that some jobs, of course, get taken away. Other jobs get created. There used to be a job called a, a calculator. It was a person. 
who sat down and you know, added up numbers. Well, we don't have those anymore, right? Um, but we have other things that now are possible, like we have people who, um, I don't know, there's people designing AI software, there's people um, testing autonomous self-driving vehicles, we didn't need that before. There was a group of folks in, um, in, the, in, the, in the US where they're testing the self-driving cars on, on public streets, a bunch of kids thought it would be funny to make fake stop signs and step out and hold the stop sign and make the, the cars stop, right? It's really funny until somebody goes to the hospital, right? Now somebody has to modify the code to say, the, the, the AI says, I think I see a stop sign. Is this a logical place for a stop sign? Did the car in front of me stop? Did I see a stop sign there yesterday? Well, none of that was in the code. Well, think about all the hundreds and thousands of people employed. Then the counter argument is, yeah, but we're really talking about the marginalized people that deliver things and drive things and you know, do very simple jobs. Absolutely true. So let's help them. Let's figure out what jobs we can help them do. Maybe we can do rating of photos. Maybe we can do, um, all, there's, there's lots of things that need people to do them. And we can still improve the human condition. The trick is whether we focus on that or not. Do we just use the AI to make a dollar or to make a buck, whatever you call your currency, right? Or do we use AI to do something that improves the human condition, that helps drug discovery, that helps transportation, that helps hospitals, et cetera? Um, one of the problems with AI right now is that some of these algorithms on the higher end, so people who do stock trading, people who do uh, make certain types of decisions where there are AI recommendation engines, sooner or later, the human being makes a decision that's different than the AI recommended. And once in a while, the human being is wrong and the AI turned out to be right. And all of a sudden, you have to explain why you didn't do something that was recommended by the AI. On the other way around, when the AI is wrong, well, we say, well, it's unexplainable. We really can't. We'll tune in. Right? We hold ourselves to a higher standard than we hold our machines. Now, that's probably a good thing, but it's a thing. And we should pay attention to it. And we should think about how our lives are slowly changing. I say, I will never report to a robot. But then Outlook tells me to go to a meeting, and I go to the meeting, right? I'm already reporting to a robot at some level, right? And you can't deny this. We have to recognize it and move on. The other problem we have is now everything is connected to everything. And there's a cost to that. We want privacy, and we want customization. Well, those are opposite things to want, right? So if everything is connected, that means our mistakes can travel much more quickly. This is a story about a, a very unfortunate situation where this message was sent to all the mobile devices in Hawaii. Emergency alert, ballistic missile threat, inbound to Hawaii, seek immediate shelter. This is not a drill. Everyone in Hawaii got that message. I don't know what I would do if I saw a message like that. I don't know how you seek immediate shelter in this day and age. The, the, below it, it says uh, there's two voicemails from mommy Maybe you should listen to your voicemails because I don't think anything else is going to help. This is horrible. People had cardiac issues. They had car accidents. All kinds of things happened. And then somebody realized that they were doing a test somewhere and the, somebody didn't get the note and they pushed the button. It sends this message. And I'm great. You know, it's great that there's a button, right? But everything was so connected that that guy didn't know it was a test and he sent out this message. And now they take it back, right? So here's a road sign that says there is no threat. Well, which one are you going to believe? Terrifying, absolutely terrifying. So we've got to do a better job of how we connect things. Most of the connections that happen are for commercial reasons, right? We have devices, we have toys, we have products, and we want them all to be connected to each other for commerce. We want to make more money. And there's a rush to market to get these products out there. I saw an AI toothbrush the other day. I don't know what an AI toothbrush does. I mean. I guess you can put AI on anything, but what, what is it doing? And why do I need my toothbrush to be intelligent? I, I don't really understand. And if that Bluetooth toothbrush can somehow connect to some app that somehow keeps track of how often I brush my teeth, maybe I should think about how that data might be used in other ways. If you know when I'm brushing my teeth, do you know when I'm awake, for example? Maybe that's a concern, right? Um, multiple factors changing the landscape. So this is FinTech, you mentioned FinTech. Big, big money in FinTech. Another word that doesn't have a good definition, right? So we can call a lot of things FinTech. We can call, um, you know, obviously the technology to make credit decisions with different types of alternative data, that's FinTech, sure, that's great. Um, what about uh, solutions that use 
AI to improve your KYC initiatives so that you don't do business with people you shouldn't, well, maybe that's FinTech. I, I can probably connect almost any technology to almost anything financial and call that FinTech in one of the sort of dimensions of FinTech. But regardless of how you define it, just like AI, it's here to stay, it's not going anywhere, it's growing, and it will not be even recognizable in a few years compared to the way it is today. The pace of change is such that change begets change right now. Data begets data. Everything we're doing right now is destabilizing everything else we're doing, and that is the new normal. So you talked about the, the uh, burnout of the cyber guys. There's, there's more than the cyber guys. It's, it's a lot of industries where the people that are at the edge of the industry are just so fatigued by the pace of change. And then think about trying to be a regulator in these industries. I'm a scuba diver. When I scuba dive, you carry a tank of air on your back that's at a very high pressure, and then you have a regulator in your mouth, and that keeps the air in the tank from exploding your lungs, right? That regulator is pretty important. I really want that regulator to work well. If that regulator stops all the air, then I can't breathe. So the regulators can't stop everything. They have to stop the right things and they have to create the right conditions. Well, how do they do that in an industry that I just got done saying we don't really understand very well? In an industry that's changing way faster than the regulation. Technology will always outpace regulation, but that phenomenon is becoming much, much more dramatic now than it's ever been in the history of mankind. So yeah, we are living in a time of great challenge and great promise, but also great risk. Um, the legal AI landscape is just an example. Um, now there's AI looking at regulatory evolution called RegTech, right? So you can use AI to help you understand whether regulations are changing in a way that impacts the information and the decisions that you're making. That's a really good use of AI because laws are written down. They're written down in a certain form. They're written in very clean language. They don't contain sarcasm. They try not to contain ambiguity. It's, that feels like a good opportunity to use some of this cool AI. Is it done yet? Absolutely not. Uh, smart cities, AI and, and you know, connecting a city and helping with pollution. And, well, today, most of this is sensors and, and metrics, right? There's a little bit of interoperability. There's a little bit of feedback loops. That, but the reality is that we, we're only beginning to understand the impact of this sort of technology on the environment that we're in. If you came here on an airplane, you were impacted by this sort of technology. I don't know if you've noticed, but when you take off on an airplane today, it used to be that the airplane would pretty much accelerate as quickly as it could to get to that V2, that point where they rotate and then take off, right? Well, they don't do that anymore. Now sometimes it feels like they're taking forever to go fast enough. Have you had that experience where you're on the plane and you're, just, you're not taking off? You're going and you're going and you're going. When are we going to take off? Is something wrong? You know, No, they're, they're actually trying to use technology to say, we need enough thrust to take off in certain temperature conditions, and we're gonna use this information about the temperature and the humidity and the barometric pressure to use the right amount of thrust rather than maximum thrust, save fuel, save the engines, lots less wear and tear, a lot easier to respond if something goes wrong, really smart. Pretty terrifying if you're on the airplane, <laughs> but it's really smart. Um, okay. That is not the advanced slide button. Um, the hype cycle, right? There's been many different versions of this. I love this one. But basically, you know, when, when any of these technologies get introduced, there's a lot of hype. It's really exciting. It's just the next thing. And why aren't you doing AI? We need more AI. We need... Hold on. When someone comes to me and they say, well, can you use machine learning to blah? And I say, stop right there. Please just tell me what the question is that we're trying to solve. Tell me what the problem is. Let's not worry about AI. Let's worry about the problem. And then we'll worry about the solution once we understand the problem. That's part of how I deal with this hype cycle. Why aren't you using the, the most modern approach to this? Because actually it wouldn't work here. Um, great example is machine learning. Machine learning with supervised learning requires examples in order to learn from, right? So let's use machine learning to do fraud. Well, the best fraudsters, when they think they're being watched, the first thing they do is they change their behavior. If you model based on prior behavior, you're modeling how the best fraudsters are no longer behaving. You're doing the exact opposite of what you're trying to do. 
Oh, well, well, then we'll use an unsupervised method. Great. What data are you going to use? Are the fraudsters going to share data with you so that you can learn from them? Well, no. We'll, we'll just learn from, from, from when, uh, when, when they commit fraud. Well, that would be a supervised method. Oh, well, then it's impossible. I didn't say it was impossible. You're an expert, right? Of course I'm an expert. What if you use the AI to watch you and learn to do things that are more like you, and as you evolve, it evolves? Well, can you do that? Sure, that's called reinforcement learning. Cognitive AI, augmented intelligence. Got to use some new words, right? By the way, why would we assume all AI is used for good? Why would we not also worry about the fact that these cyber bad guys are getting smarter and starting to use AI to do more bad stuff? There's evidence to suggest, it's more than evidence, um, that there are now algorithms that behave like the AIDS virus. They recombine. Every time you see the virus, it looks different. How do you check to see if something like that is coming into your system? You can't. So just like with AIDS, just like with any disease, you can look at the system and you can see if the system is behaving in a way that suggests that it's been influenced by some sort of malware. The cyber professionals of the future will be more like the medical professionals of today. They're going to do clinical interventions on complex systems that they don't completely understand and they're going to do trials, and they're going to have theories, and they're going to have treatment protocols. It's not going to be as simple as it is today. Have a security operations center, find out when there's a problem, stop the problem, make sure it can never happen again. That's very reactive. So the cyber of the future is very much more like the medicine of today. Um, fraud, this is just taken from some training materials. Um, this is a fraud tree, all the different types of fraud, financial statement fraud, misre material misrepresentation, identity theft. I looked at this material very carefully. I didn't see anything in there on crypto malfeasance. I didn't see anything in there on fake news, on the dark web, a little bit on the dark web. Um, it's not like there's anything wrong with them. It's that those are very new types of bad behavior, and it's really hard to provide best practice for something that really hasn't been practiced very long. So. If I were in this field of trying to teach people how to deal with something like fraud in the context of AI, part of my brain would be thinking about how would the fraudsters of the future use the tools of the present to do something more terrifying. If you don't do that, I promise you, you will fall backwards at a much faster pace as everything moves forwards. Um, there are industries that are being created that help this, right? You can get a virtual office, you can get a IP telephone, you can have a virtual presence and no physical presence. They talk about click and mortar, the businesses that are formed sort of in cyberspace. Well, that's great if you want to have a very agile business model. It's not so good if you want to try and find the bad guys, right? Because they can change their name and their address and their presence, and especially if they're interacting with each other in ways that are obscured, um, cryptocurrency, things like that. Uh, big, big, big challenges for people who try to understand bad behavior. I, that's part of my team is doing this. That's why I'm worried about it. Um, I love this particular ad. Um, there's a quote on here where this person says, I was able to get my corporation overnight. And I had, well, I can't read it from here, but I had 20 years of experience overnight. No, you didn't. You bought a shell company on the internet. And in many parts of the world, that's illegal. Now, I don't know if this person who wrote this testimonial is a real person or not. Probably not. Um, but there's a phone number you can call, and you can have a company tomorrow that's got 20 years of experience. Well, that's got to mean something. And you can find it on a search engine. It's part of that 4% that you can search. So when we look at <clears throat> the nature of fraud, these are U.S. numbers, not global numbers. When you look at the nature of fraud, the impact of this on the economy, the impact of this on business, the impact of this on our mind share, AI is changing the business landscape, but it's not changing it necessarily all for the good. And we should think about that as well. Um, we talked about the types of, of uh, malware that sort of learn. And I, I will make one comment on this, though. Um, you might say, well, then there's nothing else we can do. Absolutely, there's a lot we can do. We can look at behavior. We, we use uh, flocking and swarming algorithms. We look at algorithms that are designed to mimic the behavior of birds and bees. So flocks of birds can bifurcate and swarms coalesce. Well, viruses do that too. So those algorithms 
combined with certain types of AI are very effective at looking at this kind of a problem. We have to ask new questions. When we think about the supply chain and we think about credit scoring, we think about sort of, okay, well, what's your supply chain? Well, it's your, your, your vendors and whatever their credit scores are and whether or not they're gonna be in business long enough to, to fulfill whatever they owe you. Well, not anymore because now everything's connected to everything, remember? So it's not just your vendors and your customers, it's your customers' vendors and your vendors' customers and your customers' vendors' customers and your vendors' customers' vendors. I can do this all day, right? Um, when you get to about six degrees, almost everything connects to almost everything else. So the impact of anything on the supply chain now arguably impacts everything in the supply chain. So if there's a fire, if there's an earthquake, if there's political instability, if there's trade wars, if there's a, a, a political upheaval, all of these things have ripple effects that can be measured. That creates opportunity and that creates risk. This is how we look at that. We start to connect everything to everything. This diagram here has been obscured a little bit so that you can't really see the, the connections and who the companies are. But we create these environments. Um, if, if any of you are familiar with graph theory, this is not a graph database, but it's graph algorithms. It's algorithms that are designed to work on massive amounts of connected data. Hundreds of millions of entities connected in billions of billions of connections and looking for these little clusters of changing behavior, looking for these second and third order influential factors that can be found with AI. You could never do this with people. A room full of people, a city of people couldn't do this sort of thing because it's just computationally overwhelming. So let's take a step back. I, I see this, uh, I love this cartoon. There's a car and it, it's gone off a cliff. And as the car is going off the cliff, the GPS is saying recalculating, right? Um, that's not an AI problem, that's a gravity problem, right? So I took this photo, I live not too far from the ocean, and the Atlantic Ocean, and um, this is a parking lot, and you can see some seabirds, some seagulls have landed in the parking lot. And if you look closely, you'll notice that each seagull landed in a separate parking space. Now a machine learning algorithm with this amount of data would conclude with a pretty high degree of probability that the next seagull will land in the next open parking space. It's a stupid question. This is a cart. I saw this in a nursing home. And the cart was sitting in the hallway on top of a cart. So I had to ask myself, I see these things everywhere, right? I had to ask myself the question, well, how did the cart on the cart get there? There must have been a cart, cart, cart that delivered the cart on the cart, right? And if you don't believe me, these are the algorithms that would allow your machine learning to reach those stupid conclusions. It's not stupid AI, it's a stupid question. So we have to be really careful. If we use the wrong tools, we will reach a conclusion with a very high degree of confidence, but that confidence is false because we started with assumptions that were ridiculous. The skills that we need in this future state are uh, not only the normal things about continuous improvement and new tools and new technology, but it's thinking about unstructured data, data that doesn't come with a description of what it is, the convergence of all of these AI methods that I'm talking about, cognitive approaches where the AI learns from watching people and converges. All of these are good approaches to survive this challenge and actually thrive in it. So instead of waving our hands and saying, oh my gosh, it's hopeless, it's too complicated, there's too much change, blah, blah, blah. That's always been a very easy excuse. Maybe it's easier now. There's plenty of things that we can do if we choose to focus on it. Um, this is sort of how we describe using AI and model tuning to try and decide what type of business a company is in. And then this is what really happens behind the scenes. This data up here, and this data down here is the same data. Up here, we used AI to try to connect the data. Uh, down here, we used a data scientist with some knowledge of that data and AI working together to form a much better conclusion about how everything connected to everything. So I don't think that there's no hope for people. I just think we need really smart people, and I'm okay with that. Um, as you start to look for these anomalies, these unusual things that stick out, these can be your next biggest threat. These can be your next biggest opportunity. So one of the things that we do is we look for connections upon connections that will be interesting for a particular business problem. So in this particular case, 
If you can see the red dots here, those are all entities that were doing business with our customer and only one other entity in this massive connected space. That doesn't happen. This is either money laundering or identity theft or some kind of bad behavior all day long. I don't know what it is. The AI found it hiding in 29 million connections. People can't look in a space that big. The AI finds it and then the AI reports it and then the really smart guy goes and figures out what it means. That's the future of working along these, alongside these AI agents. This is an example of what's called augmented intelligence. Um, this is, now that we found that very unusual thing happening, we look at it over time and we can see that it's not happening, it's not happening, it's not happening. All of a sudden, it's starting to happen and then it's not happening again. In this particular case, the bad behavior that we were looking at is when a hurricane happens and the, the government comes in and provides aid to the area, there's a lot of fake businesses and there's a lot of people that make claims for losses that didn't really happen. There's a lot of false, you know, wherever there's more money, there's more fraud, right? So you could see the, the really smart bad guys, you know, when, it, when the thing was about to happen, they sort of started to come in and work with each other and then they, they were all kind of working in the same space, this is called a clique, and then that clique dissolves, and then you've got the laggards that try and get the last few dollars before they get caught, right? That's that kind of behavior. We can actually see this happening in the data, and if we can see it happening in the past, even though the future is uncertain, we've learned something from the past. So for those of you that are familiar with Bayesian inference, it's the idea of looking behind you at all the things that have happened, guessing what's gonna happen in front of you, and constantly updating those conditional probabilities based on what you've experienced. Now you have to be careful because if you go too fast, you walk off the end. But we can certainly project out into the future and as that future gets closer to the present, we can get better at guessing about what's gonna happen. And if we use machines to help us do it and we use AI to help us do it, then we can get in front of the curve. Instead of waiting for these bad things to happen and trying to chase the bad guys, we can sort of predict where they're gonna be and be sort of laying in wait. We can be 80% ready before the thing happens. Um, these are fingerprints of anomalies. These are, we actually have created, just like there's device fingerprints, there are anomaly fingerprints. When we, when we understand certain types of connected relationships, we can then understand what they look like, and then we can look for them in other data, regardless of scale, and regardless of what type of data creates those relationships. That's a really good thing to be able to do. So instead of saying this is hopeless, we're saying, wow, this is a whole new skill we have now, we call it anomaly fingerprinting. I don't know what to call it. There's no name for it. A lot of these things we have to make up names for it. That anomaly you saw two slides ago, we call that a Marco anomaly because the guy who found it, his name is Marco. And he's really smart, right? Um, sometimes we have to actually name these things because there's no science. There's no name for how to do this yet. It's that new. <coughs> this, <coughs> excuse me, this is an example of using AI to create fake relationships based on our understanding of relationships that should be there that we can't see. So the, the brighter the color, the more fake the data is. <clears throat> the yellow things here are completely synthetic edges. And what you can see happened is the data, as we created these rational, probably reasonable connections, most of the other data coalesced around the, the, the synthetic part, except for this part on the left that stayed where it was. And if you look at it, you see that, that bullseye pattern, those circles within circles. What that is, is a data provider that was supposed to be providing data every month, but at the end of the quarter, they get busy and they just don't provide it. So they give us month one, month two, and then they skip a month, month four, month five, and then they skip a month. Well, the analytics were based on the assumption that this was monthly data, because that's what they agreed to give us. And the analytics told, the AI told us that there was an error in the data that was causing us to reach conclusions that were invalid because the data wasn't what they said. Remember when I said before that all true data is not simultaneously true? This is an example of that. You simply can't find something like this with your human eyes. It's too complicated. If we use AI to do this sort of thing, now we can make decisions that were impossible before. So if I could read your minds right now, I'm looking at faces, right? Some people are, are really interested. Some people are sitting there saying, please stop talking. Please, please don't say anything else complicated, right? 
It's okay. I feel that way too, right? But this is our future. And you don't have to do this. You have to work with people who do this. This is that updating of the conditional probability thing that I talked about. Love this quote to bring this back to like normal people speak, right? Um, Dr. Arai from Tokyo University has a great way of saying very complex things in very simple ways. None of the modern AI, including Watson, Siri, Tadai, Robot, is able to read. It doesn't understand meaning. Meaning is a whole new frontier. We can understand correlation, but we can't understand, people can understand causation. Trying to teach algorithms to do that, that's still way in the future. It's in science fiction, but it's not in science yet. Um, <clears throat> so the complexity, while it continues to mount, is changing. We're starting to talk, Mark, you talked about unemployment. You talked, I talk a lot about uh, marginalization, bias in AI, uh, federation of technology, which basically means everybody can get access to it. That's good and that's not good if they don't know what they're doing. Data rights, who owns the value created from the data that we produce. Um, agency, if, you're, if your bot does something on your behalf, are you liable for the actions of that bot? All of these things are things that regulators need to think about right now. This is a very big deal. Almost every single one of these things, except for maybe unemployment, was kind of a, a what? You know, what are you talking about? Now all of these things are main, mainstream. Adversarial manipulation, uh, intellectual property. How do you define intellectual property? Most of the intellectual property laws around the world are designed to allow you to get a patent for a device, a machine that turns a gear and moves a lever. Well, you can't really patent an algorithm and most of the things that I'm talking about are algorithmic methods. I believe it's intellectual property. Good luck trying to get a patent on something like that. So, you know, we have a lot of work to do. If I were a regulator right now, I would either be thinking, this is great, this is sweet, I have plenty of work to do for my career and, you know, three careers behind me. But if I were, um, you know, trying to advise a regulator, and I do, I meet with regulators where it's appropriate for me to do that, and I try to have these conversations, these are not simple conversations. Not, not one single one of these conversations is, well, just do this. There's an unintended consequence. It's different if you look at it uh, from an ASEAN pr perspective and a, a North American perspective or a Chinese perspective or an African perspective, marginalization. All of these issues are complex, nuanced, and different no matter where you look at them. So um, this dialogue needs to happen. All of us in this room need to be part of that dialogue. We can't just wait for people to figure this out. We have to be part of it. If we let it happen, and we're not part of it, and that's why the value of an organization like this is to be able to actually understand what we all think and how we all feel. What happens if we don't do that is we will fall backwards at an increasingly rapid and alarming rate. What happens if we do do that is we can tackle some of these issues and maybe make the world a little bit of a better place and make some money while we're doing it. That's fine. The new opportunity comes from everywhere. This is a, a great uh, model for future casting, looking at all of the different technology enablers, mobile, social, internet, cloud, and then all of the things that they enable and what has to happen in between. This model up here talks about um, new realities in the future of work. There's more um, organizations are, are less permanent. The, the workforce is going to be a lot more mobile. The, the, um, the enterprise has to be more nimble. Innovation is going to be more regulated. Innovation is going to mean something different. Great. Let's go. Let's have the conversation. Let's not let it happen to us. Let's let it happen with us. Big difference. Um, I always try to look at these emerging technology reports. Uh, just pick one. Pick one and read it, and you know, with all due respect to some of the uh, organizations that are in this room that produce reports like this, um, we need to read many of them, <laughs> and we need to consume that information across platforms to understand the difference and the nuance in that. Um, this is another sort of uh, AI disrupting AI. So I think a lot about how technology influences other technology and how that evolution is formed by itself. So uh, AI is what's called an anthropomorphic technology. It's something designed to serve man, to behave like man, to, to work on behalf of man, but it's not man. And so it's going to do things differently. And sometimes we have to let it do skills that do things differently. What are the skills we'll need in that future universe? 
What are the skills that we're going to need to be successful over there where things are different than they are over here? So it's not just who do you hire, it's what are you doing to change your own skill set and the skill set of your organization to continue to evolve at this pace. What I do is I, as I'm reading, I just take snapshots on my phone. I don't save the whole article, I just save sort of whatever I'm looking at on the screen and I put these things in different folders, new behaviors, changing perspective, new opportunity, complex issue. And then when I'm standing in line or I'm sitting on an airplane or whatever, I look at them and I think about them and I think about how they might connect to what I'm doing and what I'm saying. And I'm constantly updating. So I can't, I don't have time to read every single complicated crazy thing that comes out. But I have time to at least think about how it works in conjunction with something else. It's not what you don't know that will get you in trouble. It's when you don't know what you don't know. So, this dialogue is not the same song. You know, I talked about some similar things to some, maybe half of you or a third of you, based on the hands that went up, um, the last time we were gathered. But the, it, this dialogue has changed dramatically in the meantime. Nothing happens until something moves, until something changes. It's that change that we have to pay attention to. Um, this is some of the advice I give. Always, if, for those of you in the room that are AI practitioners, we tend to have teams that are really good at one thing, like supervised learning or unstructured data or NLP. No, you got to have methods that are hybrids, that are combinations of methods. The best of the best methods, AlphaGo Zero is a great example of that. Best of the best methods are combinations of methods. Um, mistakes, learning from our mistakes. Lessons learned are only lessons learned if we learn from them. So we have to make sure that we're capturing those learnings. There's a uh, agile, you know, we always say, well, fail fast. Yes, fail fast, but fail fast differently. If you're just failing fast, you're just being stubborn. And by the way, you don't just get to do it over because the world changed in the meantime while you were busy failing. So it's also lost opportunity. So when opportunities or risks present themselves, we have to think about this combinatorial impact in order to really be agile. The types of people that we need in AI used to be in, in data, so I'll do the equation, data plus analytics plus AI, right? Well, if it was just data, you need people that are data curators, they're analysts, they're modelers, they're statisticians, we still need all of that. But now we peop need people that are governance experts and coders and storytellers, detectives, visionaries, diplomats in some cases. It's not this or that, it's this and that. So the requirements have gone way up in order to be successful in this field. And the, the challenges continue to mount. So my challenge to you, every single one of you, this is just a starter list here of some of the things that I've talked about. Pick one that you don't feel comfortable with and read one article before you go to bed. Promise me, I'm here for you. I did all this work, I came all the way around the world for you. Do one small thing for me. Pick something that you don't think you know a lot about and read one article before you go to sleep tonight. Would everybody agree to do that? Say amen. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it.